Uh, original question, do we look to the presidential leadership too much to solve our problems? The conventional wisdom, the conventional narrative as to how we got this series of staggering claims of executive power in the Bush years is that there was a cabal of ideologues surrounding Dick Cheney uh, who had long sought to expand presidential power and they took this opportunity. And there's a reason that's the conventional narrative because the, there's a lot of truth to that. But I think the, uh, the, the cabal of ideologues ex explanation uh, ignores our responsibility, the American public's responsibility for, for driving some of these claims of, a, of, of expanded executive power. Uh, public pressure uh, had a lot to do with this. Unrealistic expectations uh, for the president to be able to terror-proof essentially the entire United States. Uh, some of you are probably familiar with the, uh, with the Harvard Law professor, uh, Jack Goldsmith. Uh, he wrote a very interesting book called The Terror Presidency. Uh, Goldsmith took over at uh, the Office of Legal Counsel after John Yoo left. Uh, Goldsmith became the, the head of the Office of Legal Counsel. Uh, and he disagreed strongly with uh, some of the Bush theories of executive power, uh, even though he was a staunch conservative. But he understood, even while he clashed with uh, the advocates of unrestrained executive power, what was driving it. He talks about David Addington, uh, Cheney's lieutenant, uh, who was one of the, the most uh, zealous advocates of unitary executive theory. And about David Addington, Goldsmith writes, Addington believed that presidential power was coextensive with presidential responsibility. Since the president would be blamed for the next homeland attack, he must have the power under the Constitution to do what he deemed necessary to stop it, regardless of what Congress said. Uh, so I, I think we're looking for responsibility for uh, this concentration of power. And the reason some of these claims were made, uh, it's important to look in the mirror as well and to consider the role of public demands. Uh, there's a narrative out there that, uh, that the Bush Cheney, Addington approach to presidential power uh, actually weakened the presidency uh, and uh, that they pushed too far and that there's been, uh, there's been pushback. Uh, well, I don't really understand how anyone could think that the presidency is weaker than it was before uh, George W. Bush took office. Uh, there have been, uh, with the uh, Faisal Amendments Act legislation last uh, Last summer, uh, the, the president essentially got legal authority for most of what he'd done uh, with the so-called terrorist surveillance program. And imagine if uh, anyone had told you back in 1999 that in 10 years the executive branch would be busily reshaping the commanding heights of the economy, uh, and that after Congress had refused to pass legislation uh, to bail out the American car companies, that the president would just decide to do it on his own. Uh, after the bailout bill, after the attempt to uh, bail out the auto manufacturers failed in Congress last December, the White House spokesman Tony Fratto said something that tells you a lot about the state of separation of powers today. He said, quote, Congress lost its opportunity to be a partner because they couldn't get their job done. This isn't the way we wanted to deal with this issue. We wanted to deal with it in partnership. What Congress said is we can't get it done, so it's up to the White House to get it done. So in other words, by, by not giving the president the power to bail out the automakers, Congress lost its uh, opportunity to be a partner, and the president can just uh, do that by himself. That's an extraordinary expansion of presidential power over the economy uh, brought to you by an allegedly conservative president. Um, I think in the time remaining, I'm, I'm going to, to talk about that specific issue, uh, the, the role of conservatives in the growth of executive power, and maybe leave uh, the future of the Obama presidency to uh, questions and discussion. Uh, in the book, I, I have a section uh, called How Conservatives Learn to Stop Worrying and Love the Imperial Presidency. <laughs> they may not love it so much in the, the next four years, but uh, uh, they, the fact is that conservatives uh, played a, a huge role in the expansion of executive power and the growth of the modern presidency. 
And in doing that, they, they abandoned what was a, originally a, a very skeptical view towards the claims of activist presidents and uh, towards claims of unchecked executive power. Uh, the right-wing intellectuals who coalesced around uh, William F. Buckley's National Review, uh, almost to a man, associated uh, powerful presidents with activist liberalism, uh, the New Deal, the New Frontier, the Great Society. Uh, Barry Goldwater, who represented uh, conservatives' greatest hope at the time for political success, wrote in 1964 that, quote, some of the current worship of powerful executives may come from those who admire strength and accomplishment of any sort. Others hail the display of presidential strength simply because they approve of the result reached by the use of power. This is nothing less, Goldwater said, than the totalitarian philosophy that the end justifies the means. If ever there was a philosophy of government totally at war with, the founding fa with that of the Founding Fathers, it is this one. Now, of course, Goldwater lost, uh, but, but uh, in that campaign, uh, th there was the birth of a, a new conservative hero, uh, Ronald Reagan, who made a famous uh, televised address on behalf of the Goldwater campaign. <laughs> it's an address that, the, uh, that conservatives are quite fond of quoting, but there, there are passages in it you don't hear much for them anymore since they've become devotees of enhanced executive power. Uh, in the, in the uh, televised speech, uh, Reagan attacked Senator Fulbright of Arkansas, who just a, a few weeks before had said, according to Reagan, that the president is our moral teacher and our leader and that he is hobbled in his tasks by these restrictions in power imposed on him by this antiquated document, the Constitution. He must be freed, Fulbright said, so he can do for us what he knows is best. And Reagan treated that idea with total contempt, at least before he was elected. Uh, he identified it with the kind of, as the kind of sentiment that would lead us down to what he called the antheap of totalitarianism. Well, that's the kind of talk that would get Rush Limbaugh or Sean Hannity to suggest that you be uh, uh, dragooned into Guantanamo Bay and uh, uh, put before a military tribunal today. Because the conservative movement looks at, uh, at executive power very different, differently than it did formerly. After the uh, 70s and 80s brought the emerging Republican majority in the Electoral College, uh, conservatives uh, grew in office, you might say, and adopted a, uh, a view of, of presidential power that had previously been associated with, uh, with FDR, JFK, and LBJ. But <clears throat> the thought I'd leave you with is that, the, that this view of the Constitution uh, and this view of the president's role this shift away from a, a limited constitutional officer, a mere chief magistrate who is not a moral leader and who is not expected to, uh, to uh, have unchecked power in times of danger. Uh, that this movement away from uh, the founders' view is, is, is deeply unconservative. Uh, Russell Kirk, the intellectual founder of modern conservatism, uh, held the rule of law to be a, a core conservative principle. It, he wrote that in every age, men and women are tempted to overthrow the limitations upon power for the sake of some fancy temporary, fancied temporary advantage. It is characteristic of the radical that he thinks of power as a force for good, so long as the power falls into his hands. Uh, the conservative, Kirk said, resists that, that temptation. He insists on constitutional restrictions, on political checks and balances, on restraints upon will and appetite. These are essential elements of freedom and order. Uh, I think this is something that, uh, that people from all sides of the, this is a principle that uh, is timeless. Human nature has not changed. The founders' insights into human nature are as valid today as they, as they were in the late 18th century. And I think that uh, checks and balances and restraints on will and, and appetite are as necessary today as they, as they ever have been before. And I, I think that's something that people on both sides of the political spectrum ought to appreciate. Thank you.